Hello everyone. Last time in the series, we talked about the structure of DNA. Today, we're going to talk about how DNA makes copies of itself. So, let's jump right in. In our previous video, The Structure of DNA, we mentioned how DNA replicates in a semi-conservative fashion. This means that when DNA replicates, one strand is used to build the other complementary strand. Remember that this means adenine pairs with thymine, or uracil and RNA, and cytosine pairs with guanine, in what is called Watson-Crick pairing. You remember them. Remember also that DNA is directional, having a 5' prime and 3' prime end. Directionality is very important in replication, as we'll see in a moment. The process of DNA replication occurs during the part of the cell's life cycle known as interphase. Interphase occupies about 90% of a eukaryotic cell's life and is when the cell's normal processes occur, such as obtaining nutrients, growth, and making proteins, among other things. Interphase is split up into three portions, G1, S, and G2. G1 stands for gap 1 and is the period in which the cell primarily grows and synthesizes proteins. S stands for synthesis and is when the cell replicates its DNA, the relevant segment for this video. G2 stands for gap 2 and is when the cell prepares for mitosis or meiosis, which we'll return to in a later video. In the previous video, we briefly noted that Russian biologist Nikolai Koltsov proposed in 1927 that the molecule of heredity replicated in a semi-conservative fashion. As this was before the structure of DNA had even been determined, this was very speculative without any experimental data to support it. He was still correct though, but how did scientists figure out that he was? After Watson and Crick laid out the structure of DNA, there were three proposed models of DNA replication, semi-conservative, conservative, and dispersive. Semi-conservative replication would produce two copies of DNA, each containing one complete strand of the original and one completely new strand. Conservative replication would produce one copy with two new strands and the other being the original double helix. And lastly, dispersive replication would produce two copies, each containing regions of original and new strands. To test these hypotheses, scientists had to figure out how to distinguish between the original strands and the new DNA strands that were synthesized during replication. In 1958, Matthew Messelson and Franklin Stahl, both geneticists and molecular biologists, conducted their famous Messelson-Stahl experiment using different non-radioactive isotopes of nitrogen, nitrogen-15 and nitrogen-14. DNA containing nitrogen of the heavier isotope, N15, would be denser than the one that contains the more common N14 isotope. Thus, they could distinguish DNA by their density via centrifusion. They grew two control populations of E. coli for several generations. One was supplied with a nitrogen source containing only the N15 isotope, and the other with the N14 isotope. As expected, DNA extracted from the cells that were grown with N15 had a higher density compared to DNA from the cells grown with N14. Next, they took a sample of E. coli that had been growing with N15, thus having only that nitrogen isotope in their DNA, and transferred them to a medium with N14. After each cell division, they extracted DNA from this population and compared it to the densities of the control populations. After the first replication, DNA was found to have only one co-density that was intermediate compared to the N15 and N14 controls. This meant that replication produced DNA that contained both the original DNA with the N15 isotope and also new DNA with the N14 isotope, which is inconsistent with the conservative model of replication but still consistent with both semi-conservative and dispersive models. However, the DNA that was extracted after two replications had two distinct densities, one intermediate density and one that was the same as DNA containing only N14. Both were found in equal amounts. This was inconsistent with dispersive replication, which would produce DNA of only one density. So the only model that could account for the results of messelson stahl experiment was the semi-conservative replication model. After this experiment, scientists figured out more and more details of how DNA is replicated by the amazing molecular machinery of the cell. 
Now the first step of replication is separating the two strands of the DNA molecule at a place called the origin of replication. This is accomplished by enzymes called topoisomerases unwinding the DNA. Among other things, they introduce transient breaks in the DNA strand. Without these, the process of unwinding would twist the DNA ahead of the origin of replication, causing entire molecules of DNA to coil around themselves, inhibiting the replication process. And remember that nucleotides are connected to each other via hydrogen bonds. That bond must be broken if the molecule is to be copied. Breaking the bonds is done by another enzyme called DNA helicase. This causes DNA to look like a sort of Y, called a replication fork. Single-stranded binding proteins also attach to the DNA strands to stabilize them. This results in two separate strands, each acts as a template for the synthesis of a new DNA strand. This is why the separated strands are also called the template strands. The two template strands are pointing in opposite directions, one 5' prime to 3' prime and one 3' prime to 5'. Prime. This creates a problem because both of the two new DNA strands are built in the direction of the replication fork, and the enzyme that builds new DNA strands can only read the template strand in one direction, from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. DNA replication on the template strand with the favorable 3' prime to 5' prime direction, which is called the leading strand, occurs with relative ease. First, an enzyme called primase adds an RNA primer. Then, clamp-loading proteins bind at the junction between the primer and the template strand, which is followed by sliding clamp proteins that bind adjacent to the clamp-loading proteins, forming a ring around the template strand. This protein complex then loads an enzyme called DNA polymerase onto the primer template junction. The ring of sliding clamp proteins maintains the association of DNA polymerase with the template strand as replication proceeds, even for many thousands of nucleotides. Now, DNA polymerase reads the template strand in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction, starting right at the 3' prime end of the RNA primer. This new DNA on the leading strand is synthesized continuously as the replication fork proceeds further on the original double helix like an opening zipper. The exact same process cannot happen on the other template strand with the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, which is called the lagging strand because, as stated before, DNA polymerase cannot read the template strand in that direction. So how does it work? Well, the new complementary DNA on the lagging strand is synthesized piecemeal. Just as it was on the leading strand, the RNA primer is added and DNA polymerase still reads the template strand in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction which appears to be backwards on the lagging strand. However, differently from the leading strand, DNA polymerase works discontinuously, adding only one relatively small segment of DNA at a time. Then as the replication fork proceeds further, a new RNA primer is added. From this, another DNA fragment is synthesized by DNA polymerase in the same 3' prime to 5' prime direction until it meets the RNA primer from the previous cycle. And the whole process repeats itself adding an RNA primer and then filling the space between the new and old RNA primer with DNA again and again. These segments on the lagging strand, each consisting of an RNA primer and a small section of DNA, are called Okazaki fragments. Then on both the leading and lagging strands, the RNA primers are removed by other proteins and the gaps they leave behind are filled in by DNA polymerase. So now the complementary strands are entirely composed of DNA. However, replacing the RNA primers with DNA still leaves behind a gap in the backbone of the complementary strand, called NIX. DNA polymerase adds new nucleotides at the 3' end, but it cannot finish synthesizing the backbone when it meets the 5' end of another strand that was already in place. So another enzyme called DNA ligase catalyzes a reaction that forms a phosphodiester bond within the NIX. This step finalizes DNA replication, at least locally. Please note that this process happens in both directions from the origin of replication, as two replication forks move away from the site. Also, see how the same template strand is the leading strand at one replication fork and the lagging strand on the other. The two replication forks proceed until the entire chain is replicated. Eventually, you end up with two new double-stranded DNA molecules produced in a semi-conservative fashion. It's also important to note that this was a general description of DNA replication, which is different in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, where different sets of enzymes play similar roles.
In prokaryotes, the main DNA replicative enzyme on both the leading and lagging strand is called polymerase 3, while in eukaryotes it's called polymerase delta. The formation of RNA primers is also different. In prokaryotes, RNA primers are formed by a single primase enzyme, whereas in eukaryotes, a complex of two enzymes, polymerase alpha and a primase, produces short RNA DNA segments. Furthermore, in prokaryotes, the RNA primers are replaced with DNA by the combined work of RNase, H, and polymerase 1, which is different from the main replicative enzyme of prokaryotes, polymerase 3. In eukaryotes, the RNA primers are removed by other exonucleases, and the gaps are filled in by polymerase delta, which is the main replicative enzyme of eukaryotes. The size of Okazaki fragments are also different. In prokaryotes, they are typically 10 times longer than in eukaryotes. 1,000 to 2,000 bases compared to 100 to 200 bases, respectively. The reason for why this is the case isn't well understood. Looking at the process of replication at the scale of the genome, we see more important differences. The genomes of prokaryotes tend to be small, and they replicate themselves typically from one single origin of replication relatively quickly. For example, E. coli can replicate its 4 million base pair genome in less than 30 minutes. If eukaryotic genomes like ours with the size of 3 billion base pairs were to replicate from a single origin of replication at the same rate, it would require 3 weeks to complete itself. And this is made worse by the fact that DNA replication is actually slower in eukaryotes. Thus, eukaryotic genomes use multiple origins of replication, which can number in the tens of thousands, allowing the genome to complete replication relatively quickly. Also, eukaryotic genomes are linear, while that of prokaryotes tend to be circular. This creates another problem for eukaryotes. Remember that DNA polymerases only read the template strands in the 3' to 5' direction. This means that, at the end of linear chromosomes, the newly synthesized DNA on the lagging strand cannot be fully completed. DNA polymerase must have a 3' onto which it can add new DNA nucleotides. However, here at the end of the newly synthesized DNA, there is only a 5' end and there is no room for an RNA primer that can provide a 3' end to be placed further upstream. This results in the new strand to be slightly shorter than the template strand, which ends up having a 3' end overhang. If nothing else happens, the end of linear chromosomes will become progressively shorter after each replication cycle. This cannot continue indefinitely as the genome will eventually become too small to withstand any more shortening. When that happens, the cell cannot duplicate its genome, resulting in cellular senescence, i.e. the cell ceases to divide. To prevent this outcome, eukaryotes employ a special mechanism to maintain the ends of their chromosomes. The repetitive sequences called telomeres at the ends of their chromosomes, which are produced by enzymes called telomerases. We have mentioned this process in the video on chromosome 2. Because they are temporarily disposable, the telomeres act as buffers, protecting the genes by letting themselves get truncated instead. An interesting, albeit rather grim, detail to note is that most of our somatic cells, as well as those of many other multicellular organisms, duplicate themselves without maintaining their telomeres. They don't express the telomerase enzyme. This leads to something that's called the Hayflick limit, which is the maximal number of times a normal human cell can divide before becoming senescent. Among the few cells that do make new telomeres are our germ cells, which ensures that our offspring do start with long telomeres. It's been hypothesized that the shortening of telomeres leading to cellular senescence in somatic cells is a mechanism to inhibit the formation and spread of cancer. Unfortunately, sometimes this fails, and cancer cells evolve the ability to maintain their telomeres by producing telomerase, making it possible for them to divide indefinitely. Alright, that's enough on the topic of DNA replication. Remember that this process in eukaryotic cells occurs during interphase, which is about 90% of the cell's life. The other 10% will get its own video, as a lot happens then. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.